By the early part of the 16th century, Spanish and Portuguese exploration and conquest had already redrawn the map of the known world. Indeed, one French writer ventured the view that thanks to the Spanish and Portuguese, quote, we can truly affirm that the world today is manifest in its entirety and all of humanity is known. It was a bit of an exaggeration, but that knowledge had certainly advanced. By 1507, we get the first map of the world that included the continent of America, named after Amerigo Vespucci, the Florentine naviga navigator working for Spain, who had explored the east coast of South America. And if you take a look at that map, you'll see that the state of knowledge is still unsure. It confirms commonplace assumptions that were not yet disrupted. So for example, you can notice how narrow North and South America are with the idea that it would still be easy to reach the Pacific Ocean. But you might also notice that there's an opening between North and South America preserving the idea of a westward sea passage to Asia. The developments of the Iberian world in the 15th, I'm sorry, the developments of the Iberian powers in the 15th and 16th century had created a new world. They brought continents into contact, Europe or Eurasia, Africa and the Americas. And they also facilitated the exchange of people and cultures, but also tragically germs. The consequences were profound and far-reaching, none more so than for the native peoples of the Americas. The conquest and colonization of the native people of the Americas was one of the most devastating processes in world history, so much so that some call it genocide. There have been many attempts to estimate or measure the demographic loss involved in that process, and the estimates vary widely from highs of 100 million to lows of 10 million. And the confusion owes in great part to our inability to estimate with any accuracy how many people actually lived in the Americas before 1492. And I am certainly no expert on this, but it seems to me that these days historians usually estimate the demographic loss at about 50 million, and they talk about as many as 20 to 40 million people dead in the first uh, uh, century of colonization from epidemics, the violence of the conquest, displacement, and cultural destruction. What emerged in the 16th century was a new Atlantic world dominated by Europeans. A famous map made in Istanbul in 15, around 1513 showed the findings of Columbus and Vespucci already clearly marked. In fact, the enormity of the Iberian power's territorial gains prompted this observation from one Ottoman official. He said, God has given the sea to the Christians while reserving the land for the Muslims. Ottoman sultans were obsessed with the need to compete against the new maritime empire of Spain and Portugal. Just one example of the kind of connected histories the historian Subramanian has pointed to. Other Europeans clearly were not the only people fretting about this new reality. There was no way to dispute the extent of Iberian dominance. Before England even got a toehold in the imperial game, Spain and Portugal had basically already divided the New World up among themselves. As a Catholic power subject to Rome, Spain had gone to the Pope in the 1490s and asked for a ruling about the legitimacy of its possession of the Americas. And when they got the ruling, it was so generous to them that Portugal protested. And in 1494, Spain and Portugal worked out a treaty uh, signed uh, between the two powers called the Treaty of Tordesillas. As you can see on the map, the Treaty of Tordesillas imposed basically a line straight through the middle of the newly discovered Christian world, dividing it up between Sp Spain and Portugal on a north-south line that was placed halfway between Columbus's islands in the Caribbean and Portugal's Cape Verde's island. Lands to the east of the line went to Portugal, which gave them the coast of Africa and what is now Brazil, and the west went to Spain. Needless to say, this was a division with enormous consequences and lasting meaning in the world. The early dominance of Spain had other implications that would be crucial in the New Atlantic and especially Spanish colonial world. 
From the perspective of, of the 21st century, I think it's especially interesting to note how quickly a debate emerged in Spain about the morality and legitimacy of the conquest and settlement of the Americas. By the mid-16th century, after a half century of settlement in the Americas, Spain's colonial, colonial experience was already so extensive that the monarchy and leading religious and secular thinkers had already engaged in an extensive debate about the morality of the Spanish mission in the New World. It was a debate prompted by one of the most famous books of the early modern world, Las Casas's A Brief Relation of the Destruction of the Indies, which was published in 1552. And in that book, he clearly cast the conquest of the Americas as a series of atrocities against the indigenous peoples. Among these gentle sheep, he wrote, the Spanish, the Spanish appeared like wolves and tigers and lions famished. And in fact, in later editions of the book, woodcuts would be added depicting those atrocities. And they have left a shocking impression. They were shocking images, and they left a very strong mark on early modern and modern cultural consciousness. Within Spain, Las Casas' book prompted an astonishing internal debate and long-standing juridical changes in the status of the native people in the Spanish possessions in the Americas. Most consequentially for us, for us, perhaps, is the fact that as a result of the book and the public debate, the monarchy moved to prohibit the enslavement of the Indians and to establish a separate Republic of the Indies to go along with the Republic of the Spaniards that was the juridical uh, way of uh, ruling the territories. This was a Spanish colonial policy that would have profound consequences for the trade in people from the African coast to the Americas.